Welcome to our Energy Efficient Hot Water Boiler Plant Seminar, and this is going to be uh, part one of two parts, and we are happy to have you today. And in typical with James and Pleasance, we are doing uh, a system seminar. It is not a product seminar, it's a system seminar, and we're seeing a lot of need to be talking about the new boiler plant designs, and the reason very simple is to make sure we get them done properly. As we go through today, what will we hope to design? What do we hope to have happen to us? First thing is we want to look at why condensing boilers versus non-condensing boilers. What makes the difference? How do they work? A little bit at the piping layout of these and why it's important to slow down and realize if you're going to do the new condensing boiler designs, even the new water heater condensing boiler designs, you're going to have to slow down and maybe rethink the way you pipe things. Look at a few boiler loops and troubleshooting where the problems might be showing up. And I want you to understand why a condensing boiler is more efficient in a very basic, simple way. I want to keep it simple for you, but don't want to insult you. But I think it's important you understand where it came from and why it works the way it does. Uh, what, are the, what is the best way to control these things? What's the best way to put them together control-wise? And look at piping, primary, secondary, verbal primary pumping. Uh, what is the best way to pipe these? new condensing boilers up and why. And last but not least, a little bit at pick valves, pressure independent control valves. This might be a good application here because of the delta T. I want to make sure you understand what they are and how they actually might fit in well with a modern condensing boiler plant. So we got to have a place to start and I like simple things. And I want to make sure you truly understand from the very beginning the difference in condensing versus non-condensing bulbs. That's the key thing we want to work on. And we're going to spend some time here. We're going to go all the way back to the very beginning of combustion and make sure you clearly understand why condensing product gives us more efficient uh, applications and what are the uh, ways and means we get that done. So let's look at combustion basics. Again, I want to go all the way back to the very beginning with a chimney. Here, here's a basic old boiler in a chimney. The reason I use the word chimney is there's, there's no fan here. There's no fan. The, the air going into this combustion process has to be induced by a tall vent or a tall chimney to make sure we got enough air to draw and make sure the products of combustion are put out the top of the chimney and not into the space or the mechanical room where this, where, where this equipment is installed. This would be true of some old, old stuff, but we've got to start here because of efficiencies and so you understand the process. So if you have a chimney, no fan for the combustion, how much air does it take? Well, you've got to have the combustion air, let's call that kind of the, the, the primary air, you've got to have it and a little bit of secondary air just to make the burners work and get them going. And you've got to have excess air, let's call it dilution air, you've got to have enough volume of that excess air to get that chimney to draw. You know, you've got hot combustion products, you've got to draw, and you've got to have some excess air to make it flow. And, and that works out to be, on the right-hand side there, roughly uh, 50 SCFM for every 100,000 uh, MBH on a gas appliance. Now, we're talking a lot about gas today, and before we uh, get too far away, if you can believe what we read in the papers, the USA is sitting on two to 300 years worth of natural gas, and the price of natural gas has come down, and we would be predicting it would be pretty stable. So you're going to see, in my opinion, a lot more natural gas applications. Even your electric utilities are going more and more right now to gas, natural gas, for gas peakers, and it's just going to be the, the fuel looks like of the future. So it's a good place to be talking. So these are non-condensing boilers. They are working with no, working with no fans with a chimney. And that's the kind of the combustion process and the excess air process we want to look at. Now, let's take a little bit closer look. Basically, you're lighting a match to natural gas. You're creating a byproduct of heat. Combustion products are going up the chimney. And this chimney has to be sized on 100% capacity because that's the worst situation. In other words, the chimney has to be big enough to handle full fire, full modulation of the board. And when you start down below 100%, the chimney stays the same size. All practical purposes, the amount of air going up that chimney stays the same, even if you're only firing, say, 50% fire. Kind of keep that in mind with this excess air thing. 
efficiency and what it might be doing. So let's look at this basic combustion process a little bit and see if we can tie some of the stuff together. This is very fundamental, very basic, but it's worth repeating. So I've got the natural gas here. Let's call it a methane. You know, CH4 would be uh, the basic molecule we're dealing with. So we're bringing natural gas in, and we're bringing an O2 mo uh, molecule, oxygen, in with it, and we're going to strike a match and make it and make it fire off. What happens? Well, in that combustion process, as you see from the slide here, we're getting heat. Heat to hit a domestic water, heat to hit a hot water, whatever we're trying to do here, this is what we want is the heat. That's fine. What else do we produce in this basic fundamental combustion process? As you see from this, we generate carbon dioxide, CO2, hopefully going up the chimney, because we've got a hot chimney going out the top. An interesting thing is, if you haven't looked at it lately, we create water vapor. H2O water vapor molecules are created in the combustion process. And that's interesting because this is created as a gas. And this gas normally would be going up the chimney. And again, I, I like simple things. You know, you can go back to your old steam tables. You take a close look. If you take a pound of uh, condensate, a pound of water, and you want to make it into a pound of steam at zero, it takes roughly 1,000 BTUs. Actually, maybe 980, 985, but let's just use 1,000. If i got a pound of steam, and I'm going to condense it back to a pound of uh, condensate, pound of liquid, then I'm going to have to give up 1,000 BTUs per pound. If I've got a cooling tower, which is an evaporative animal, and I want to make that cooling tower work, I've got to evaporate water. So every pound of water I evaporate in a cooling tower, I soak up 1,000 BTUs. So let's go back to my combustion process. What, what I'm trying to tell you for every pound of water vapor going up this chimney from this combustion process, you are throwing away 1,000 BTUs for every pound. So the question kind of becomes, how much water vapor are we creating here? And it's going out the chimney, and we're throwing it away. So that's what I want you to get out of this basic water, or basic process. One more comment here. In a non-condensing appliance, then we are throwing it out the chimney. And if we let it condense, if we let the temperature in the stack get too low, if we let the return water temperature to our boiler get too low, then this water vapor is going to condense. And if you condense the water vapor in the stack, what is it mixing with? It's mixing with CO2, carbon dioxide, and water create what? Carbonic acid. It eats you up, carbonic acid. So you kind of see how all this kind of goes together. And we get talking non-condensing where there's a water vapor going out the top versus a condensing appliance where it's raining in the bore and the CO2 is mixing with it, we've got carbonic acid to deal with. That's the two key things you kind of need to learn from this chart, and we're going to talk more about it as we go. So if I take this, uh, this, this, this 1,000 BTUs of the water vapor, it's called latent heat. It's called hidden heat. If I look at natural gas, how much of the energy content of the natural gas is sensible? That's what you can feel, by the way. That's what you can put your hands on and feel versus latent. And it's roughly 90% of the energy content of natural gas. If you can get to it, it is sensible heat, the heat that you can feel. Roughly 10% in the combustion process of natural gas converts itself over to water vapor. And if we're non-condensing, goes up the chimney and we throw it away. Ah. So what you're saying, Chris, is possibility we could get this latent heat in this water vapor going up the chimney. Maybe we want to condense that and get that 1,000 BTUs, that 10% back into our board to heat our product. And that's kind of where we're going. But the important thing to do with natural gas is understand this ratio of about 90% being sensible and about 10% this hidden latent water vapor going up the chimney. So you kind of tie all this together a little bit, and you start looking at efficiencies, which is the reason we would do any of this to begin with. Let's take a quick look, and, and, and this is just one, one characteristic of an efficient bore. This chart kind of plots 
the percent CO2 in the stack versus the condensing temperature of the heat exchanger. In other words, if you let the heat exchanger get below these temperatures, that water vapor is going to condense and it's going to rain in the boiler and we've got a liquid in there along with the CO2 we got to deal with. But it might be important to kind of begin to grasp these numbers. Going back to my chimney, see my chimney was sized for 100% air. So if I got excess air, and remember CO2 is a byproduct of combustion. So by looking at percent CO2 in the stack is one measurement of the efficiency. Not the only one, but it's a place you start taking a look at the efficiency of the boiler itself. So as you see here, as I increase the percent CO2, your efficiency is actually going up. And as you increase efficient, the, efficient, the, the percent CO2, you're cutting down on the excess air. So if you've got excess air, then your percent CO2 has got to go down. If you match your combustion air directly, your percent, percent CO2 goes up. So basically, as your efficiency kind of goes up, the percent CO2 is going up, and look at the condensing temperature. In other words, if I'm at 3% uh, excess CO2, which means I got a lot of excess air, I got a chimney size for 100% fire, and I'm back at 30% fire, my condensing temperature is what, maybe 90 degrees? So that's pretty easy. That means I can have the condensed water temperature coming back at 90 or above. I'm okay. But as I increase efficiency, and I, and, I, and I get my percent CO2 up, say a 10%, as the blue dotted line shows here, then my return condensing temperature is about 130. In other words, at 10% CO2, a fairly high efficient boiler, if I let the return water temperature get below 130, then that water vapor is going to condense. It's going to rain in my boiler, and I'm going to perform with the CO2, carbonic acid, and I've got a condensing water going on whether I want it or not. So that's the key thing to look at is that return water temperature is the point you need to make for me. What is the dew point? What is the point it will rain in my boiler? As I go through this process, you'll find roughly natural gas and pretty efficient appliance. If you have return water to it below 130, it's going to begin to rain. That's pretty much the dew point. Dew points being where the water vapor goes to a liquid water and you give up the BTUs. Anything below about 130 degrees with natural gas, a decent modern appliance, you're going to start raining in your boiler. So that's kind of the threshold between designing for condensing versus non-condensing boilers. If you go to a million BTUs of natural gas, you just, you're buying natural gas, you're paying money for it, you go to a million BTUs and you burn a million BTUs, you light a match and you burn it, you produce 93 pounds of water vapor per million BTUs. Let me repeat that. I want to keep simple things here. 93 pounds of water vapor is being generated for every million BTUs of natural gas you use, roughly 10%. Now, we just agreed a few minutes ago that each pound would be, what, about 1,000 BTUs of heat energy is in that water vapor that if we condensed it back to a liquid, we get the 1,000 BTUs back. So if you send this up the chimney, what are you doing? If you are throwing away 93 pounds of water vapor up the chimney, you are throwing away 93,000 BTUs. Ah, so now you begin to see why this condensing thing is so important to understand. If we could condense that safely and not tear a boil up, we could get back 93,000 BTUs. We could pick up 10% in efficiency roughly. If we did it perfectly, we could pick up roughly an additional 10% in efficiency in a bore by going condensing versus non-condensing. And that's the message you need to take. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep spending a buck on fuel and throwing away a dime. It just doesn't make any sense. And that's why the world has changed. We've been doing some surveys of our own people. Uh, very rapidly, this has happened in the marketplace. We're seeing roughly 90% of the new bores being quoted being condensing bores. Repeat that. Roughly 90% of the new bores we see in this day and age are condensing because you can't keep throwing away a dime for every dollar in fuel. It just doesn't make any sense. We're even seeing the same thing take place with water heaters. The water heater is a little bit slower getting there, but we're probably around 50% of 
of the new water heaters we see commercially now are going condensing because of this dime. They want to get that 10 cents back. So let's go back a little bit further and, and kind of make sure you understand all this. This, this is uh, some laws that we can't change about the condensing. It's been going on a long, long time. The old cast iron boilers had the same issues. Now these were huge boilers, lots of water in them. We had, a, we had an insertion Honeywell Aquastat that kept these boilers 160, 180, whatever it was, hot enough that we didn't have to worry about this condensate forming on the heat exchangers. If it did on the cast iron boilers, it did rust. It did pit the boilers. The old timers knew this, and we learned how to stop that by doing what? Making sure the return water temperatures were above 130, and it stopped. So that's kind of the message, and the old timers knew all this. So what's changing now? What, what's happening? Well, we're asking you now to slow down and change the way you think. We can no longer design boilers and hot water heating systems the way we used to. If you're going to buy a condensing boiler, and 90% of the people are, don't you want it to rain in your boiler? Don't you want it to condense? So we have to make sure we do get that latent heat. Why would you pay for something and not get it? Why would you pay more money or go to a more sophisticated boiler to get the condensing latent heat and then design a system where it won't work? The key thing is you've got to start looking at return water temperatures, not supply the way we've always been taught. All supply is critical. I didn't say it was not. But you can't look at that uncondensing more. You've got to make sure you look at the return water temperature and make your supplies whatever you need to to be below that magical number to rain. So let's have a little fun with this and go back to some old basic stuff and kind of bring all this together for you. At next year, non-condensing boilers. And these would be boilers with no fan with a chimney. Okay? going back 30 to 40 years, and we're going to work our way up. No chimney, no fan. The chimney has to be sized on 100% combustion, 100% of the air. Even if we modulate down to some lower fire rate, we still got the same amount of air. You got the same amount of air as you modulate down. Your percent CO2 is going down, and your efficiencies are going down. If we had everything perfect in a perfect world, we might claim 80 percent combustion efficiency. I doubt if we really ever got there. We probably did in the lab. We probably did everything perfect. But in the real world, I think we probably had trouble doing this because of the excess air. Again, I repeat to you, no fan, chimney, big vent or chimney, your choice. Why? I think this slide helps out a whole lot. The old, old product 35, 40 years ago with a vent, with a chimney, no fan, that blue being air and the red being the natural gas, at 100% fire, we had 100% natural gas. And that was the most efficient point because we didn't have all this excess air. Remember, the excess air going up the chimney is taking what with it? Heat. That's what makes it draw. Hot, hot air rises. So basically, any time that you need to make this thing work, you've got to have enough excess air and get it hot enough to rise up the chimney to make it draw. So we size the chimney 100% fire. Look at 75% fire. For all practical purposes, we have the same amount of air. But the gas is now 75%. But again, we've got the same amount of the chimney, so the percent CO2 from the combustion process just went down. The efficiency just went down. Look at 50%. 50% natural gas, how much air? For all practical purposes with the chimney, we still got the same amount of air. Now again, our percent CO2 is going down. And the same thing at 25%. As you can see, as you modulate down, the amount of air stays roughly the same. Natural gas amount goes down. CO2 goes down. Efficiencies go down. So we were taught to take these boilers and try to run them full fire. You know, we want to run them, load them up, run them full fire. That's the best efficiency point. So what happened next? Well, before we get to the next piece, a 2 million BTU boiler little damper in it would take a 20-inch vent. That's basically what boils down to with a chimney. If you've got two million BTUs, you need a 20-inch damper chimney. And that's pretty much the flu vent size you had to have. Well, then maybe 20, 25 years ago, roughly, don't hold the exact dates, we just started playing around with putting a fan on these things for combustion air. We says, okay, maybe there's a way we can match the amount of air we're putting into a product versus the amount of natural gas that we're burning. Okay, 
So let's call this fan assisted non condensing, non raining in the bore boils. What happens? Well the efficiency jumped up a little bit. Doesn't look like a whole lot here, but in reality it's much bigger than you think because we're now going to match the air to the amount of natural gas. So that means as we modulate down, the efficiencies stay fairly constant going down. We don't lose it. The percent CO2 stays about the same. So if we can set these things up properly, we can approach these efficiencies. And the next slide will show you that point. We can begin to hold those efficiencies as we modulate down. So just make sure you got the message here. 100% fire, red gas, 100% fire, blue air. Look at 50% fire, just as a quick example. What we have done now is we've modulated the gas down with a fan so that we're only giving uh, the amount of air that we need to match up with 50% fire. And now our percent CO2 stays relatively constant coming down and our efficiency stay relatively constant coming down. So now we can run it part low. And another side benefit of this is we don't need as much excess air. The chimney had to have a bunch of excess air to make it draw because there was no fan. I've got a fan now so I can make it work with the fan. So the bottom line is I was able to reduce the vent size or the chimney size for 2 million BTUs from 20 inch down to 14 inch. Huge dollar savings here just in the vent sizing coming down. And this really is true because we don't need as much air anymore because we have a fan. What did we do next? Well. Let's push this concept of fan-assisted combustion as far as we can. Let's make it as efficient as we can. And remember, we said in a million BTUs of natural gas that what 89% or up to 90% of those BTUs was sensible, and 10% of those BTUs roughly was just hidden heat or latent heat. I'm talking about a non-condensing appliance here, is pushing it as near condensing as I possibly can and this is like 15, 20 years ago, what is the efficiency we can get at? We were looking at getting them up to 87, 88% thermal efficiency, and we're getting about all the sensible BTUs we can get. There's probably about 90% sensible BTUs in the natural gas, and we're getting 87, 88% levels. So we're doing pretty daggum good. Hard to do, but we pushed it right up to the edge. We pushed the efficiency as high as we can get it, without raining in the boiler. A uh, little side note on this, the boiler code says that 83.6% combustion efficiency and higher by code, even if non-condensing, you have to use category four condensing vent. So even though you were not condensing, you had to pay the extra money to make sure you had the right vent to make sure you were okay. Just as a side benefit of this. This is where we were. Yeah, 15 years ago, maybe that ballpark. That was the best we could do. Then what? Well, wait a minute. Maybe we can go ahead and go condensing. You know, we still got this 10% latent heat we've been throwing away. Maybe we can find a way to go ahead and let it rain in the boiler. Maybe we can build a boiler out of materials that have that. And maybe we can go ahead and go condensing and pick up that extra dime we're throwing away. So what do we got now? Remember the 10%. If I'm at 88% efficiency non-condensing and I add 10% back because I condensed it, I'm now able to push that thermal efficiency up to you know, 94, 99%. That's a heck of an improvement. And now you begin to see where everybody's going that way. Can we really get to those 98, 99% numbers? We can if we pipe them right and run them right and design them right. That's what we're going to talk about. You cannot get there if you don't make sure it rains in a bore, and then you want to make sure you maximize the efficiency of your investment. That's what we want to talk about. How do you get 98, 99%? And it doesn't matter whose condensing bore this is. These are just fundamental principles and application of those to push that efficiency as high as you can. So we've got to do that. We can also, by taking advantage of the latent heat, we can condense it, and we condense it, pick the 10 cent up, and then red is a fundamental little statement I want you to make. At full fire, we have this heat exchanger size there, this stainless steel heat exchanger, whatever the material may be, that we've got for condensing more. When we go to 25% fire, 25% natural gas, and we're going to match the air to 25% air, that heat exchanger didn't shrink. 
So we got a heat exchanger size, fun of sapphire, and now we're only going to put 25 percent fire on it. So naturally, as you modulate down, you pick up efficiency. You got the same heat exchanger size for 100 percent. You only put 25 percent through it, and you're matching the air and the gas to that. So modulating down, as you modulate down a condensing bore, anybody's condensing bore, the heat exchanger doesn't shrink, and your efficiency start up. So one quick thing you need to learn out of this, that's how we start pushing towards that 99% is by running them modulated down, not at full fire, but maybe at 50% fire is a place to look. Let's talk about that a little bit more as we go. So basically looking at condenser boy, condensing water technology, we're seeing basically two types of, of, of technology being used. One is this pulse combustion process. And the other one is this old-fashioned gas burner-fired process we've been used to. So let's take it. These are basically two ways of getting it done. So let's take a quick look at both. On the pulse com combustion boiler, there is no burner. Uh, you're, you've got a spark plug. You've got air and natural gas coming together, and you're sparking it like a little spark plug. Bang, bang, bang. And, that's, and you're generating the heat out of this, and it works pretty good. Uh, you're bringing gas in it, and you've got an electronic spark, and that's that's why they call them pulse condensing technology, because that's exactly what they're doing. It's like a big spark plug firing on and off, on and off, on and off. Now, a couple of side benefits of these things: they do work a little bit louder than others than traditional gas-fired boilers with, with, with heat exchangers. So the the vendors that make these most of the time will put a muffler on the insulation right up front to to reduce that extra extra noise. And I guess the last comment would be I would not put one next to the principal's office. Uh, I'd be conscious of where I physically put them, knowing they're going to be a bit louder and application-wise, just making sure you don't create a noise situation. They work. The comment's just meant to help you in an application standpoint, and that's the message given to you. Let's uh, look at this burner technology a little bit. Uh, let's call them second-generation condensing boilers in the USA. Uh, all of this technology came from Europe, as you'll see in just a minute. But this second generation, the vast majority of these condensing boilers are one heat exchanger. To begin with, they had a standard heat exchanger with a condensing heat exchanger, two steps. The vast majority of them today have gone to one step with one heat exchanger. These are smaller modules. The uh, vast majority of them are stainless. The, the controls are much more simple than they used to be. And, and they really can be pants laid together. And they're pretty, very reliable. I, we're there. Uh, for the condensing second stay as second generation boilers, we're there. First cost is coming down, highly competitive with non condensed Let's take a quick look so you understand the difference in the old-fashioned uh, non-condensing boilers and how you ran them in efficiency and the new ones. This is important from an application standpoint to get this. So the light green there would be the old non-condensing boilers and the top dark green would be the condensing boilers. And as you see, this is a plot of boiler capacity, boiler fire rate versus efficiency on the vertical left-hand axis. And you note that the old constant temperature boilers basically had the peak efficiency 100% fire, in this case 71, 72 percent, which is probably pretty, pretty real. But look what happens as I reduce the fire rate on the old boilers. They start deteriorating around about 50 percent. The efficiency starts down. So at 20 percent fire, I'm down to 60, 10 percent down to 50. And this is fairly typical of the old bores that, that did not have control of the air properly. Let's go to the top now to the condensing bores. Condensing bores, dark green. Remember that heat exchanger size doesn't shrink, and we're going to match gas and air together. So as I reduce the fire capacity on a condensing boiler, top green line, what do you see? You see the efficiency moving up at part load. All the way down, we're at about 10 percent fire. I'm up to 97, 98 points. I'm going to repeat this point to you many times in the next few minutes. So please don't misunderstand what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to make sure you understand the fundamental application of condensing boilers would suggest to you to run multiple boilers versus one. The old boilers, we ran 100% fire. With a condensing boiler, 
you'd rather have three at 33 percent than one at 100. You'd rather have two at 50 percent fire than one at 100 because by going to two at 50 or three at 33 percent, you're going to be have a much higher efficiency. Four or five points you can pick up by simply staging your mortars properly and loading them properly. In the old days, we went 100 percent fire for falling over and on. That was the thing to do. Not anymore. So you've got to change the way you think. You want to run a condensing bore at part load if you can because you're picking up efficiency. And I can now begin to push you up towards that 97, 98 points by doing what? Running them part load and making sure they condense. Now, also got to look a little bit at, at, at return water temperature. We're going to bring both of these pieces together. You're going to hear them a couple of times, so don't panic. But this is a plot of return boiler water to the bore versus the efficiency of the bore. And the dotted green line is roughly 130 for natural gas, and it's roughly the dew point, roughly the condensing point. In other words, if you have a condensing bore that you purchased and you said it was going to be 99% efficient, that's great. If you give it return water going to it of 140 degrees, it's not going to condense. It's not going to be anywhere near that efficiency. It's going to be in the 80s. You've got to get the return water cold enough to make it rain in your bore. You want it to rain in your bore that's condensing. That's the best way to describe it. You want to make that water vapor rain back in there, and that's what you want to happen. But here's the piece a lot of people miss. Look at what happens as I go down below that 130 on the return water temperature to the bore at 120, at 100. See the red line? The lower the return water temperature, the higher the efficiency. Look at 60 degrees. I'm up to 97, 98% efficiency by lowering that return water temperature as cold as possible. So what are you getting out of this? The colder the return water, the higher the efficiency. Wow. Two key things you've learned here, I hope. Modulate your boil down for higher efficiency and give me colder water for higher efficiency. If I get both of those things going on, I get the best of both worlds and I can get you 97, 98, 99% efficiency that you're after. And you can control these most of the time in the way you design your plants. So what am I saying to you in a nutshell? The heck with your supply of water temperature. I really can't say that, but that's the way I'm trying to get the message to you. The heck with it. I'm worried about return water. I want to make sure I'm below that 130, it's not going to condense at all. But I'd rather be colder. The colder I am on the return, the better off I am. Then you begin to see why this delta T, maybe these pressure independent control valves where I can push the delta T up might be helpful. And that's the where we're trying to take you to. Now let's bring both of these concepts together on one chart and just drive this point home. I said I was going to mention it to you two or three times. I'm going to put both pieces of what I just tried to teach you in one chart. I've got a plot of temperature across the bottom and efficiency in the vertical axis again. That solid red line is 100% fire, 100% input, 100% load on the board. The, the, the dotted red, not just dotted, but the dashed red line is 50% input 50% fire. We've modulated the boil down to 50%. So let's look at what happens, first of all, with a solid red line, is we reduce the return water temperature. See the magical line around about 130, it starts jumping up, you know, that ballpark because I've started to condense. But the colder I get the return water, the higher the efficiency of this particular bore. I peak out for a 93, 94% efficiency by lowering that return water temperature down to 70 degrees, 75, 80 degrees, as cold as I can get it. Got the message? But take the same bore, the same bore, and take it to 50% fire with this dashed red lines. What happens to that thermal efficiency now? Take a quick look. It goes way up. In other words, if I ran two bores at 50% fire versus one bore at 100% fire, I've gained, what, uh, four or five points of efficiency just by piping it that way. So you see the straight dashed lines below 130 jump up rapidly. They peak out at 97, 98 points. So if you ran two wars in parallel at 50% fire versus one, just that simple little control strategy is just that simple. On this particular border setup, you pick up four or five points. Is that not worth doing? That's why we have in the seminar. And this is true of all condensing boards. You've got to learn to think a little bit different. And this is what we want to drive the point home to you. 
Now, if we look under the condensing bowl, there's a couple of other issues when you look at as we go. Let's just make sure we've got them now straight. First of all, here's a little simple schematic of a condensing bowl. We've got cold water coming in and hot water going out. That's what we wanted. But we're also going to pipe the air to it. We're going to have a, a fan assisted combustion. We're going to bring in outside air. And we're going to exhaust the outside air. It's going to be a Category 4 venting. Uh, a lot of the venting systems come from the particular boiler manufacturer that are rated Category 4. So go to your boiler vendor, get their recommendation on venting, and go with what they suggest you do. In addition to that, at the very bottom down here, we got obviously got gas going into it. But at the bottom, we got this condensate tank. We've got condensate coming out. And that condensate will be acidic, and we have to deal with it. So my message is, the addition thing is you got to make sure you got the right vent, and you got to make sure you deal with that condensate that's coming out of the bottom of the boiler. We want it to rain in the boiler. When it rains in the boiler, you got rain. What are you going to do with it? You got to get rid of it. So let's look a little bit at this heat exchanger construction, a little bit of this condensate, and give a couple comments. And I think the first place you start is if you got water vapor raining in a boiler and you're mixing it with CO2, which is carbon dioxide, you're going to form carbonic acid. And this acid is going to have a, you know, a pH of around 3 to 5. That's just, good. That's just the way the combustion works. You're going to wind up with a pH of 3 to 5. And this is going to be on the wetted areas of the heat exchanger. I mean, you, you're, you're below 130 in the heat exchanger, so they're raining on the boiler. You've got this condensate being formed, and that's going to be the pH you've got to deal with. So we've got to make sure we pick the right heat exchanger material. If you survey the market today, we see three basic types of heat exchangers being used. Uh, stainless steel, aluminum, and cast iron. Uh, I would say it would be a fair statement that the vast majority of the condensed boilers being sold are stainless. I would say vast majority. But these other two materials are out there, and let's just take a quick look up. If I look at stainless first, which is the vast majority of it, this uh, technology came from Europe. The Europeans have been doing condensing boilers for 15, 20 years before we really got around to it, and it's stainless. Uh, 316L, the designs came from Europe for every basic uh, American boiler made. I know mean, we've got a second generation going on where we got a, some of our own designs, but the original designs on these uh, really came from Europe. So uh, nice thing about stainless, it handles a wide range of pH. That's why we have stainless to begin with. I've got two statements here, and you've got to be careful when you start applying these. Low water volume or high water volume. Or high water volume. Most of the stainless steel heat exchangers are going to have a very low volume of water. You know, you've got a cast iron board, you can make it huge. You can have hundreds of gallons of water in it because the cast iron doesn't cost you that much. But if you're going to take your heat exchanger and make it stainless, you're going to make the heat exchanger small, right? So it winds up being very small, little modular heat exchangers, and there's very little water volume in most of these heat exchangers. But I caution you, you need to look at your brand of heat exchanger you're buying, the product you're buying to see which way it may be. That's why I've got the double statement, low water volume, high water volume, because it's going to depend on the brand. It's going to depend on the type of material you're using. Uh, most of the time, the stainless is going to be a very low volume. And last comment, the most corrosion resistant material we have out there, highly successful. Most of it will be stainless. We also see some aluminum heat exchangers. And aluminum heat exchangers are attractive first calls compared to stainless. Uh, they are usually pressure limited. Um, the ones I've seen are 50 to 60 pounds normally. You can get them higher, I'm sure, but uh, I've seen some pressure limitations, so be aware that when you use them. But it is aluminum. And if you check out a chart of aluminum, there is a narrow range of pH that uh, the aluminum is acceptable in. And you have to deal with that. So when you check the IONM on these aluminum heat exchanger condensing boilers, they all will give you the statement that you got to have a good chemical treatment system to neutralize that 3 to 5 pH stay in warrant. If you do that, fine. But you've got to make sure that you do have a chemical treatment system, and you've got to make sure that you keep that pH neutral or you violate their warranty. I'm, try, I'm just trying to tell you, if you're going to use them, fine. They work great, but read the IONM and make sure you've got the right pH. Just that simple. Uh, fairly low water volumes most of the time, just like the stainless. Cast iron, yeah, cast iron is being used as well. Now we know cast iron with carbonic acid is going to rust. That's okay. How can you get away with cast iron in a condensing wall? 
the answer is very simple. You make the cast iron thick. <laughs> you just make it thick. And the vendors that are using this type of an approach are making the heat exchangers out of thick enough material. They'll give you a 10-year warranty on them. And all they're saying is it won't rust out in 10 years. It's going to rust. It's going to form some, some, some damage up there from corrosion, but it will not eat through and they'll give you a 10-year warranty. They do some special operating techniques to try to blow the condensate off the top of the heat exchangers a little bit. And they give you good heat transfer. Uh, there's no minimal return water temperature. Uh, they're fairly durable heat exchangers, as long as you can accept the fact that they're going to rust on you and you're going to be eating into them over a period of time. So that would be the only comments there. They do work as long as you accept the fact they have to be thick. They've got to make sure you got thick cast iron. So let's go back to this condensate thing a little bit and have a couple of comments on that. We're burning natural gas. We're making it rain, so we're forming this acidic material with a pH, a 3 to 5, 3 to 6, something like that. About every 100,000 BTUs of a condensing water that's condensing, you're going to make about a half a gallon of this condensate. Uh, Temperature-wise, you can't put it down the drain over, what, 120 or something like that, and it's got to be neutralized, okay? So for every million BTUs, you got five gallons of this stuff you're producing. What are you going to do with it? Not a hard thing to handle, but don't blow by this. We need to slow down and figure out what we're going to do with this. Where do you put this condensate byproduct? Where does it go? What are you going to do with this seed material? And basically, we're going to suggest that you buy or create a neutralization kit. It, it, it's a way you take the condensate into this kit and it neutralizes the pH. The pH becomes neutral, so you can put it down the drain and you can do something else with it. Now, if you don't do that, and I saw a job just recently where they let this condensate on, just drip out onto a concrete floor. In a matter of a month or two, it eats right into the concrete floor. Yet it will eat in a regular con concrete because it's, it's acidic. It's 3 to 5 pH. It's going to work on it. So you need to deal with this and put a neutralization kit. And all the vendors sell these kits. But let's be honest with you. It's very simple. It's just a box of rocks. That's all it is. It's just limestone. It's just a box of limestone. And you drip the stuff through it. The condensate thoroughly neutralizes it. You, you can go to Lowe's or uh, Home Depot and buy limestone, rocks. It's no big deal. So it's not a difficult thing. They're not expensive. My message to you is you've got to deal with this. Just don't ignore it. Just, just go ahead and specify the neutralization kit or create one of your own. Whatever you want to do, the bottom line is do not ignore the fact this stuff is acidic. You're going to have to treat it pH-wise and get it neutral. Not hard to do, but you are responsible as a vendor we can't control that. You've got to specify that. That's all I'm trying to tell you. It's not hard, but just do not ignore it. Take care of it. So let's go a little bit on the design side of the equation, start taking a few pictures here of comments, what we want to do. Uh, Chris Edmondson is going to give you a little thumb. I like to stay below 120 in a return work. The actual condensing point for natural gas is probably around 130, give or take a little bit. But we really, really buying against condensing more so we really, really want it to rain. Let's just say 120 is a rule of thumb. There's nothing magical about the 120. You can make it a different number. But trying to drive home to you, we want that return water below 120 all the time to be as efficient as we can get. So let's have a little fun with this. And I kind of bring them up here all together at one time. What are the potential changes uh, that you've got to be aware of when you're designing a uh, condensing bore system. Well, what's different? Well, obviously, if I got to keep the return water temperature 120 or lower, I would assume you would agree with me that the supply water temperature is going to be lower. You're not going to be designing a 180s and 160s anymore. You're going to be bringing that supply temperature down. You want the bigger delta T you can get. You want the coldest water you can get. And you're going to probably bring your supply temperatures down to 130, 140, 120, even lower to get the return water temperature down. Remember, I'm not worried about your supply. I'm worried about the return because I want my boiler to rain. I want it to condense in my boiler. It's critical to me. So once you recognize and give that, you've got to start looking at the return. And when you look at the return, you're going to lower your supply. If you lower supply water temperatures, what impact does that have on your design? The first thing you need to look at might be the hot water heating coils. Uh, you might need to look at cold surface. 
And, and what we're getting at is instead of 160, 180 at a, at a real full load, you may be 130 to 140. You may have to increase the size of your hot water heating coils. We have found most of the time they're probably big enough already, but I can't guarantee you that. You need to go double check your design and your hot water, typical hot water selection coils and see what they do. A lot of these are one row, a lot of them are two row. So what are you going to be doing? You may come along and change everything to road. You may come along and add more fins to the inch, or you may actually slow down the face velocity, which makes them a little bit bigger. Either way, you might have more air pressure drop, static air pressure drop, on your fans. So you might need to look at your fan horsepower and your fans a little bit if you increase the static air side as you increase the cold surface area or the amount of heat exchanger. And again, these are small changes. A lot of the times there's no change required at all, but go double check and make sure you're comfortable with your hot water heat exchanger selections or your hot water heating coal selections. Next comment is balance. If I'm going to go from a standard 20 degree delta T design, for example, to 40, which I would strongly recommend to you, if I go to 40 degree delta T versus 20, I just cut my GPM in half. Q is equal to GPM times 500 times delta T. I keep the Q the same, BTU is the same, and I double my delta T, my GPM goes to 50%. In other words, if I've got this heating coil that I've been designing on 2 GPM, I'm now designing my heat exchanger on what? 1 GPM. So balancing becomes more critical. Flows of the ore, balancing is more critical. You've got to balance these things or you may have an issue. The last comment I think should, should, should make sense to you now, but we want to control delta T's. We want a high delta T. We want that cold return order it might be a good place to start looking at pick valves and making sure we are getting those delta T's we're after because we want the higher design delta T's and these pressure independent control valves just might be worth taking a hard look at. So condenser water summary, keep the return water temperature as low as possible, as cold as possible, as long as possible for more efficiency. Definitely keep it below 120. Uh, if you can use multiple boards, Run your systems with multiple boilers part loaded wherever possible to approach that 99% boiler efficiency. Run your boilers at part load as long as possible for higher efficiency. Well, how many times I said those two things to you, but hopefully the message has been delivered to you now and you kind of got the idea. On all condensed water systems, we need to be striving to do this. So let's take a quick look at some of the applications for condensing boilers, new and retrofit, and see how they might fit in with what we're doing. So here's an example of something that I call a no-brainer. So water source heat pump. Here's, an old, here's a water source heat pump system with a boiler and a, and a closed circuit cooler specific in this case. And you might note this is an old-fashioned uh, atmospheric boiler. It's been piped in with a constant bypass circuit setter to try to make sure that on this non-condensing motor, we kept the return water temperature above 130. Why? Because what is the operating range of a water source heat pump? It's 60 to 90 degrees, I think, would be acceptable to you guys. I'm sure you could stretch it either way, but let's just say 60 to 90 is a reasonable loop temperature to be looking at a water source heat pump. So you're saying to me, Chris, if I get down to 60 or lower, I'm going to turn the boiler on and add some BTUs. Absolutely. So what is your return temperature at 60 to the boiler? It's going to be cold. And that boiler is going to rain unless you do something to fix it. So what we did here was we put a bypass around it with a circuit setter and blended it to try to make sure that the return water temperature never got down below 130 because these non-condensing boilers, if you rain in them, you tore them up. It became a huge maintenance issue. So what are you getting at? I'm saying to you that a lot of these water source heat pump jobs out there that are five or ten years old do not have condensing boilers, and they got maintenance problems. They got maintenance problems because you're raining in them because the return water temps are getting below the 130 and you're tearing them up. I'm telling you, every water source heat pump job you know of should be changed over to condensing boilers immediately. Why? Give me 60 degree return water in a condensing boiler. I'll be 99 percent efficient. Give me a low load modulate the condensing more now. I'll be 99% efficient. I can make a condensing more payoff on a water source heat pump job so fast you won't believe it. 
you, you should just stop what you're doing right now, get in the car and go find every job that's an order source heat pump job and look at the condensing water changeover, the paybacks are two to three years or less and you're eliminating maintenance problems on top of that. Because I guarantee you these that are non-condensing, the older jobs, have got maintenance issues with their boilers because they're raining in their boilers and they're not designed to do that. Am I too strong with that? I don't think so. Every water source heat pump job should be a condensing boiler. It is the perfect application. Typical range, 60 to 90 degrees. It's always condensing. I don't care what you do, it's going to be condensing. And the vast majority of the time, they're at part load. Wow, what a perfect application for condensing water. How about on radiant heat? Not a whole lot of that in Carolinas. We do have some in that warehouse at J&P Company, and it's very good stuff. This is where we're putting hot water tubing, hot water heat into the, into the cement under the floor to keep the floor nice and warm. Now, obviously, there you don't want it real hot. So we're running 85 to 120 degrees to be typical range. So this application is always condensing. And most of the time it part loads. Another great application for condensing boilers would be rating and heating. Just a fantastic application for it. i got one that may surprise you here. You know, the energy codes tell us to use outdoor air reset. So you got a 180 degree boiler at 10 degree outside design. Fine. It's a, it's a non-condensing boiler. What happens with an outdoor air reset schedule as you get the outside air going up? If it's 180 and say 10, it might be 130 supply at 50. Notice it's the outside air temperature comes up. ASHRAE 90.1 2010 Energy Code says you shall have an outdoor air reset schedule and our verbal flow. But outside air reset schedule to lower the supply temperature as it gets warmer outside. Now, tell me something. In your non-condensing water designed for 180 and 10 degree, del 10 degree outside temperature, if you go on a reset schedule, say down to 130 at 50 degrees outside, what is your return temperature? Have you looked at the return temperature? Have you ever worried about the return temperature? You should be, because if the return temperature, if your supply is 130, what is your return? 110? 115? You're raining in these boards. You're tearing them up. It's a huge maintenance issue when you put outdoor air reset schedules on non-condensing boards. And people don't think about it that much because you look at the design. The design is 180. But where is it operating the vast majority of the time and what's happening to the return water temperature? Is it getting below 130 at part load? The answer is yes. So you're raining in the boards. You're tearing them up. You've got maintenance issues. And a lot of people not even aware that's what's causing it and they're blaming the boiler vendor. It's not the boiler vendor's problem. If you rain inside of a non-condensing boiler and tear it up, that's not a warranty issue, or should not be a warranty issue. It's, it's a maintenance issue because it's raining in a boiler and the boiler's not designed for it. What a perfect way to solve that problem with what? A condensing boiler. Put a condensing boiler in there. You can still have your reset schedule. And now if it gets to 130, 110, 120 on the return side, who cares? I don't care if it goes to 60 on a return. What happens? Efficiency goes up. Now you're paying for it. So I'm telling you, on new applications this day and age, even with a supply temperature as high as 180, you want to look at condensing boilers to protect that boiler when you are at part load and the return water temperatures get below 130. It's a perfect way to solve those maintenance issues. Uh, driving all this home, I think you need to slow down sometimes and look at a typical heat exchanger, air to hot water heat exchanger. And this is a sensible heat exchanger. Let's see what happens with, with a typical heat exchanger. So the bottom plot here on the horizontal axis is percent design flow. And the percent heat transfer is on the other side. In other words, the vertical axis is how many BTs you're getting out as a percent. And the horizontal axis is percent flow. Now the red line is uh, kind of the top showing you you overflowing, you didn't gain a whole lot. Let's look at 100% flow, you're going to get 100% BTUs. Everybody see that? So 100% flow, 100% BTUs, I got my design delta T, whatever it may be. This is a sensible coil, not a latent now. Sensible, typical, sensible heating coil, hot water to air, hot water heating coil. Look at 50% flow. How many of the BTUs do you get? Roughly 90. 
So I cut the flow in half, and I'm still getting roughly 90% of my sensible heat. Look at 25%. At 25% flow, how much of my BTUs am I getting? Oh, roughly what? 70%? So what are you telling me, Chris? I'm telling you as you reduce the flow that the heat exchanger is not linear. In other words, I'm getting 90% of the BTUs at half flow. So if I'm getting, if I cut the flow in half and I'm still getting 90% of the BTUs, what's, what's happening to my delta T in theory going up? Do you, do you see the delta T has to go up to balance? So in a heat exchanger that is modulating down, the two-way valve is shutting the flow down a little bit, the delta T should go up. Wow. Going up to high delta T means what? That means my return water temperature is colder. That means my condensing boilers are more efficient. I like that. How are we going to make sure it happens? Maybe this is a good application for this pressure independent control valve, those pick valves, which you talk about later, and this is why. We want that big delta T. We want the water as cold as possible. The colder the water you give me to my condensing boilers, the higher my efficiency. Not a bad way to go. This is an outdoor air reset schedule. Kind of jumped ahead as usual. This particular one is set for zero degrees, zero degrees outside air, 180. My return would be well above 130. But at 60 degrees, my supply is 100. And my return is well below 130 because my supply is, and I'm running into more. Typical outside air reset. I think you kind of got the message. So let's kind of summarize some comments on putting in new condensing bores and some applications. And, and again, this is a repeat of things we said, but I think it's so important to all the condensing bore applications you get into that you need to be aware of. First of all, increase the delta T. Don't, don't go with 20 degrees. There's nothing wrong with 20, but the higher delta T's make a lot of sense. Uh, they give me colder return waters. My bores are going to be more efficient. Uh, it cut my pipe sizes down. And I don't like this sometimes, but it cuts my pump sizes down. So I, I, I'm seeing most designs probably about 40 degree delta T, to be honest with you, on hot water heating now. I see some at 50, some at 30, but there's nothing wrong with it. We're going to 40, and you might start thinking about it. Balance is more critical. If I'm cutting the, uh, the flow rates down, I've got these small loads I'm trying to handle, I've got to make sure I get them balanced. And maybe it's not a bad place to look at a pressure independent control valve to make sure I'm getting those high delta T's, especially when I modulate down, I should have my delta T's beyond design. That's good. I want that cold water. Look at your design heat transfer on your hot water heating coils. You're going to have lower supply temperatures because you're trying to make sure you get the return temperatures down. And you may have to change the sizing of your heat exchangers. And you may look at the static pressure across those heat exchangers that may or may not impact your fan power. Uh, consider system supply temperatures strictly from the standpoint of the fact they got to come down. We want to design our return, but don't forget the impact on the supply and how that's going to size your hot water heat exchangers. We want to make sure our design maximizes the number of hours we can get low temperature return water. In other words, we want the water as cold as possible, as many hours you can give it to me. That's going to give you the most efficiency. That's why we're doing it to begin with. This efficiency optimization boiler staging is a great idea. And real simple, all that says is I'd rather run three boilers at 33% than one at 100. I'd rather run two at 50 than one at 100. And you may want to cycle your boilers so you know you want to get equal run time on your boilers. So equal run time on your boilers and do what I just said. You've got an efficiency optimization schedule to do that. Most of these vendors can supply you with a factory uh, mounted uh, efficient optimization program that would do this. And I would strongly recommend whatever brand of boiler you want to buy, specify that you go to one of those systems. I really think so. If you're not going to do that, get yourself a good control vendor who can do the same thing and meet that criteria I gave you about making sure you're putting boilers online, multiple boilers online at low fire to get that efficiency up. And it kind of says the same thing as that last statement. Increase the efficiencies with multiple boilers. I really would prefer to be running three boilers at 33% than one at 100. And keep that in mind when you specify them and how you buy them. Uh, let's just keep running with this a little bit and look a little bit at retrofit. And the retrofit applications are going to sound uh, like the new ones, because that's basically where we're headed. So let's look at water source heat pumps. Um, 
water soil seed pumps. I said, it's a no-brainer. I said, we should stop the seminar and get in the car and go find all these jobs and change them out. I really believe that. I really believe that strongly because another thing we didn't mention to you, these old non-condensing boilers have fairly complex controls on them. I do away with all that stuff and get rid of the three-way valves and get rid of the blending valves. I just stick the condensate condensing bore in there. I don't care how cold the water is. So you eliminate a bunch of controls and you eliminate a bunch of maintenance costs. That water soil seed pump job is always condensing always at part load and most important to you on a retrofit, quick payback. We've seen paybacks less than two years. We've seen people claim that the paybacks are less than two years because they had maintenance issues and the maintenance issues were eliminated. The maintenance issues were eliminated because of this. And that's a huge number that you can't really plug in on your payback, but it very well may be the driving force. We also mentioned to you the outdoor reset schedules. And we see a lot of situations where people are having maintenance issues with older boilers. Say, say you got three boilers. You got three boilers in a situation, and all three have outdoor air reset, all three non-condensing. You got huge maintenance issues. One simple approach that would be, and this works really well, it's kind of what we call a, a mixture of these things or a hybrid, is we, we would take those three boilers and take out one boiler only and replace that one boiler with a condensing boiler. The idea behind the condensing bore is we're going to run it as core lead bore condensing all the time. So the return water temperature below 130, let it rip. Let it run all the time. The efficiencies go way up. The only time we're going to turn on the two older bores, which are in parallel, is any time the outside air is cold on your reset schedule and the return water temperature is above 130. And they won't run that much. They will not run that much. But they, when they do run, they'll be safe, and you stop the maintenance issues because you don't rain them anymore. Great application. Only buying one bore out of the three, and you got the two, you got the other two for standby. It's perfect, and it cuts the dollars right down. The, the payback on this is is very quick. I think you should strongly consider. You should strongly consider looking at that. Uh, this hybrid bore thing I just mentioned to you. Here's some guidelines on how you might do that. But the message again is you're reducing the first cost. You put a condenser bore in running as you leave bore about all the time, and your paybacks are just awesome. And this is some basic guidelines, kind of rule of thumbs, how you might want to approach that. If you get a situation like that, get a vendor who understands this and talk to them because uh, a lot of times the uh, customers will say, let's change all my bores. Don't have enough money. It would be nice to change all three, but you don't. So now you can VE a value engineer it down to where you're just changing one of the three boilers out, yet you're still getting the vast majority of the savings because that condensing boiler runs as the lead boiler. It runs all the time. And that's a real good way to save a job that's in trouble with money on first calls and still give the owner a great application and a great, great project. Uh, one last project I like to look at, and some of you young kids may have never seen these things, and there's not many of them left, but I think it's an educational piece, it's what we call a dual temp system. Uh, dual temp system basically, and I'll show you a picture next, you had one set of pipes, and you heated and cooled with the same set of pipes. So here's what, here's what it looks like, a real simple method. Uh, you got two, you got, you got a two pipe system, heat and cool. In other words, you turn the boiler on, the chillers off, and you can heat. You turn the, or off, you turn the chiller on, you can cool. So the same fan coil, the same heat exchanger, the same two-way valve is going to be sitting there doing heating or cooling as required when that when it comes on. So the message is we got to make sure that we do that, and we got to make sure that we have have fun with that. So let's see where we're going. So basically, if the boiler's running, and the boiler's at a, what 130, 140 degrees, so it doesn't condense for these old non-condensing boilers. How quick can you change it over from heating to cooling? I was in a seminar yesterday, and a gentleman had one of these. He told me it took him a week. He said, started laughing. I can probably do it two or three days. But when you go from heating at 140, 150 degrees over the chill water, you can't just take that 140 degree water and dump it in your chill. It's going to blow the charge. Now, if you've got two-way valves and blending valves and a way to do it, or sit there by hand and gradually do it, you can do it faster. But if you don't have the sophisticated blending valves, which these old jobs probably did not, it's going to take a long time. Bottom line is you don't want to do that. Going the other way, you don't want to put 45 degree water, 55 degree water in non-condensing boilers. You're going to make them rain in the boilers. You're going to tear them up. So you've got a huge waiting time. 
condensing bores work great here because if you had a condensing bore and you were going to go over the chill water, for example, you could let condensing water run on down 50 to 60, 70 degrees before you change over. So your wait time is insignificant. Going from chill water back to the boiler, turn the chiller off and turn the boiler on. Who cares if it's 45 degree water going to the boiler? The boiler is just more efficient. So if you got one of these, it's a great retrofit, real simple thing. It probably is going to save a lot of maintenance problems. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gone through section one, and we're going to continue with section two next time, and this is where we're going to pick it up. Appreciate you having time with us, and we've enjoyed it. I hope you got the fundamentals down. Next time we get together, we're going to pick up uh, on part three and part four of this in session number two. Have a great day. Thank you very much.